My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hello, and thank you for joining me for another episode of the David Summerfleck podcast. My guest today is Allison Pena. Is that correct? Pena. Pena. Hi, Allison. How are you doing today? I am great. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today in this interview. I thought your background was really interesting and unique when I first uh, read some information about you. Just so we have some context, can we start with your your professional background and experience and then get into where you are today? Okay. Um, so I grew up in New York City and... Um, for professional experience, I've done a whole variety of things. So I was a Merrill Lynch financial consultant at one point. Um, I've done an extensive amount of proofreading and editing for advertising firms, pharma companies, financial firms, legal firms, pretty much anything you can imagine. I've done that kind of work. Um, and then when I was about to turn 50, I was at a, I was a pharmaceutical editor liaising between an advertising firm and a pharmaceutical company. And I asked myself at almost 50 if I was doing what I was born to do, and the answer was no. Yeah. Absolutely not. And it was one of those sort of watershed moments where you either just, okay, I'm going to slog it out till I retire, or you pivot. And so I, in fairly short order, quit my job and started trying to figure out what I was born to do. And I started coaching something I called the Affluence Code, which was something I created. Because from when I was young, it always bothered me that everyone didn't seem to be able to thrive. Couldn't understand it. Made no sense to me as a kid because there were these amazing people and they were suffering. And it didn't seem to be how much or how little money they had. It didn't seem to be anything. And so when I started uh, figuring out what I was born to do and, and started this coaching practice, what I discovered is that there are three things that pretty much everybody cares about in some order. And this is what matters. So the first is um, doing impeccable work. Everyone cares about their work, about doing something that's worthwhile, fulfilling their purpose. So that's one of them. The second is nurturing one-on-one -on -one relationships. And the third is serving their community, having the people around them be lifted up by their presence in the community. But the question is, what do you care about first? Because that's how you thrive. And it's especially important after a loss because the fastest way to come back to yourself is to get solidly in your zone of genius and do what comes easiest because everything feels hard, right? So if your thing is work, dig into work. People might say, lay back, you know, don't do anything. But if work is your thing, that's the worst thing to do. Um, and so what I discovered is that if people could figure out what they were, in what order these three ran, mm. they could thrive. 
consistently and always. They could access their zone of genius at will. And everyone has gone through those times where everything just works. Like you take exactly the right action all the time, you meet the right person, you get the right resources, and life just starts clicking along. And most people I've met have had that experience from time to time. But how do you get it deliberately whenever you want? And for me, that was the affluence code. So I started helping people with this. And then uh, went along, was doing that work for a while. And then in 2015, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And the lifespan for someone with pancreatic cancer is less than six months. We were together almost 25 years. You know, just when, when the doctor says it's cancer, your heart sort of drops to the bottom of your toes. Now, how long ago was that when uh, he first had the diagnosis? October 12th, 2015. Okay. You can see you don't forget those dates. Um, and then he died at home in my arms September 10th, 2016. So he lived 11 months. Okay. Yeah. And that for me created another pivot. So I, you know, was at every doctor's appointment, every chemo session. And so I was pretty much taken out of a lot of what I was doing. And my um, affluence code first is community. So I really lead in, leaned into my community and I started sharing the journey from inside the journey that we were on. His thing was work. So he was working up until the Thursday, two days before he died. He was an artist, he was a mm. painter. Um, and so by really leaning into our own zone of geniuses, we were able to, in really a horrific circumstance, thrive as best we could, like really live. Now, when you say you were sharing it with your community, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, family members and friends or uh, people who were uh, had read your book or, or, or you were coaching or? No, on social media, I was actually saying, you know, this is what we're doing and this is what's happening. I was sharing photos of us doing things. Um, as, as he got thinner, he went from 263 pounds to 146 pounds at six foot three. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty doggone skinny. Stark. And yeah. he had relatives in Australia. And one of the ways that I shared what was going on without saying anything was I shared photos of us. And including him at 146 pounds. And so that they would know that they needed to call and they needed to be in better contact. Um, I needed self-care practices for myself so that I myself would survive through all of this. Because the person with cancer gets lots of attention. The person taking care of everything else gets, but I'm the one with cancer. Except if you're with someone for 25 years, you're absolutely every aspect of your life is, is hit by it. So how do you cope and how did you cope? Um, I coped by living. So I coped by, um, I needed to, I knew that I needed to move emotions through my body or I wasn't going to make it. If, if the, all the grief and fear and anger and shame got stuck in me, I was going to be in real trouble. And so for me, one of the ways to move emotion through my body is um, singing. So I, I had wanted to be part of a cabaret show, group cabaret show. 
I had sung in gospel choirs for over 10 years. But as, you know, a hundred person, one person in a hundred people. And I really wanted to stand on a stage and sing my own stuff. Just me. I really wanted to stand and, um, and, and do, uh, speak about my work on stages. Those were things that I wanted to do for a long, long time. And then in that 11 months, I sang on four stages and I spoke on three. It's on my bucket list for 10 years, 10 years. And yet in this crunch, in this real crunch time, it got done because my embarrassment and my um, fear that I might do it wrong or let someone down or be, was absolutely insignificant in the face of what was going on with my husband. And our viewpoint was if life was short, if our life together was now measured in potentially weeks, why not live? Why slow down? Why not just live full tilt boogie? Go for it. And that's what we did. So how did that, how did that change to you eventually taking on the, the bad widow title? Yeah, what that gave me was that gave me, um, it taught me how to be fearless. So it taught me about when, when you're literally facing death with someone, it makes you appreciate life more. And so Bad Widow came about because after Dave died, um, nobody knew how to deal with me. I was crying. Some days I would cry eight hours. Like just cry and cry and cry and cry and cry. Second year, I could go zero to rage in about five seconds. None of this is comfortable for someone to be around because right. basically, you know, they want to help. They want to do something, but there's nothing they can do. There's actually no, there's nothing that they can provide that the person who's grieving actually wants because what they want is the person back. What they want is the whole thing to rewind. And so bad widow came about because I realized that these were conversations that people weren't having. People were willing to talk about the grief and the anger and all of that after they were through it. But there was nobody who was talking about it from inside the middle of this experience. And so I started. I started actually saying, well, you think this is my experience, but it's actually not. This is what's going on. You know, including moments where I could barely get out, out of bed. Including days where I didn't take my husband's hospice drugs. Although I was tempted. I mean, there were some bad, bad, bad moments, and I started sharing about what was real instead of trying to look good in the middle of it. And what began to happen is people started writing me and saying, oh, my gosh, that's my experience, too. And that's how Bad Widow came about, was telling the truth. Okay. Now, okay, tell me how did you rejoin life again, including getting back to work and reconnecting with people and opening up about, you know, what had happened and how do you resume life after that, that loss? It was really challenging because I was, um, I was qualified as a coach, but I had no energy to reach out to people. I was qualified as a, an editor, uh, including a medical editor, a proofreader, 
and I had lost my mind. I had no memory and I couldn't focus. So there was nothing that I was trained to do that I could do for work. And so the first thing I had to do was I had to start re-engaging in life. And I had to start from where I was because I wasn't where I had been before. I couldn't do the things I could do before, which was really hard because people just want you to bounce back. They want you to be easier, to be who you were. And it's just not possible. The first job I took, I had a friend who was a widow and she had a Halloween pop-up store. And I couldn't do much, but I could hang costumes for $10 an hour in four hour shifts. And I was exhausted when I got home mm -hmm. at the end of four hours, I would collapse because I just didn't have that much energy, you know, capacity for people, capacity to do anything at all. I had been so knocked down that getting back was going to be a baby step process. So I started there. I started with hanging shelves, hanging costumes on racks. And then I moved from there and I started expanding what I did and what I could do. You know, eventually started tutoring again, started coaching again you know, just grew out what I could do. I had to close out my husband's studio. He left me with close to a thousand paintings. And at a time when walking into that studio caused me to burst into tears for a year, pretty much every day, I had to go in and choose the paintings I was gonna have to get rid of, break down bookshelves, and ultimately, I brought them home, walking them through the streets of New York, because that felt like kind of what I needed to do to make it feel all right. And so I was walking, you know, 50 paintings through the streets of New York for 20 blocks. And people would stop me and ask me questions about them. And so I got the paintings home and that was a piece that I call re-engage. The second thing I had to do was reinvent myself. I wasn't the same person as a widow that I was as a, a wife with the same man for 25 years. I met him when I was 32. When he died, I was 56. That is a long time to be with one person. And so I had to figure out what did I like for myself? What was it that I'd gone along with because we were together for so long and especially in new relationships, you sort of, well, he likes this. So I'm going to go along and do this might mm -hmm. not be my thing. And I had to disentangle that. It was like Ivy, like he loved tennis. I didn't so much, but I did it while we were together. I loved open mics. He didn't so much. I took that back for myself. So there was a lot of trying things and experimenting and figuring out who I was and what I liked in my own right. Now, did someone call you a bad widow at some point? Or where did that expression come from? And how did it come to be that you know, you're calling yourself that did and where did that grow? How did that grow into something else? So Bad Widow, I liked Bad Widow and I chose it myself. So it's a self-claim actually. My interpretation was that a good widow would just go along and say, say something like someone offers help. Oh, thank you so much. That's so nice. But because people did, don't understand the process particularly, some of the advice that I was being given and some of the help that I was being given wasn't helpful. And so as a bad widow, I would say, thank you so much. That's not that helpful. This would be better. And I started actually bridging the communication that people weren't having about what this experience was really like. 
and what real support would look like for me that would be helpful. And what I got from the other side, from the people who wanted to support people who had gone through a loss, was thank you for saying what I need to do because I have no idea. And it was a big relief to get it right instead of wrong because people are always doing their best. Nobody means to screw it up. I'll give you a really simple example. At the beginning, especially, people would ask me, how are you? And I would think in my head, how the heck do you think I am? I just lost the man I loved for 25 years. I'm on one income, down from two incomes, in New York City. I've inherited his studio of a thousand paintings that I need to close out. There's no money to put it in storage, so it's coming home. 500 square foot studio. 850 square foot apartment, all of it's coming home with me. How do you think I am? And what I realized was that that was not a very useful thing to say to anybody because they were doing their best. Right. But I, I needed to give them something that I could answer. And I could answer, how are you today? How are you right now? If it was a limited time frame, I could answer this. And that was true for anyone who's briefed. And so what I started doing was setting the record straight. And I called that bad widow. The other reason I like bad widow is people have a really hard time with it. And badwidow.com was available. Nobody forgets it. Now, were you, were you coaching remotely or coaching in person? Were you doing workshops and seminars or what were you doing as you know as that title so i was uh coaching mostly uh virtually some in person but the pandemic came you know when i started really going into the coaching again the pandemic came so then it was all virtual i did a lot of podcasts i talked to a lot of people about this um and i've just written a book which goes into this, it goes into the affluence code. It goes into re, how do you re-engage? How do you reinvent yourself? And how do you rebuild your networks? And it goes into how I found love again. So how do you do that? And how did you do that? I mean, how, how do you come back from that in general terms that other people can absorb and then how did you come to meet someone new i take it yes um what i did was i just started pushing out my boundaries so when dave died my husband i really contracted i was some days barely getting out of bed and so i needed to at a certain point i got to a place where i was like this is not living. There's more to life than staying in bed or barely getting out of bed. And I started to want more. And at the point where I started to want more, what I discovered was that I wasn't automatically going to be able to bounce back. That wasn't going to happen. People expected it to be possible, but it wasn't possible. It really wasn't possible. And so what I started to do was I started just pushing out my boundaries. And so the job was an example, the pop-up shop job. Much later, the hardest thing was opening up to love again. My husband literally died in my arms. I mean, at home, nobody else there. And it was really hard and really beautiful at the same time. But if you love someone, you know, I knew for sure that that could be an end to loving someone. And the idea of going through that level of pain again was almost inconceivable. But I was in my 50s and I decided I was unwilling to live without love for the rest of my life. 
And I decided I got a second epic love affair. Now, the thought of intimacy was absolutely beyond me at this point. I could not be touched by someone else. I'd been with the same man 25 years. But what I decided to do was I decided to get on an online dating app, Bumble, and start going out with men doing things I like that they also like. So, hey, I like to go and listen to music. You want to go listen to music? That kind of thing. And <laughs> I got on Bumble. Now, the last time I dated was 1992, okay. and it was 2018. Times had changed. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy, but... I still didn't have much energy. And so the fastest way to kind of sift and sort so that I didn't spend time with people who weren't my people was an online dating app. I wrote my profile to describe me as clearly as I could so that the people who didn't like what I liked would deselect themselves. Right. The velvet rope policy. That's what we call it in marketing. You only want to work with people who are a good fit for you. And so for relationships, it's saying I only want to uh, be involved with people who are simpatico, not people who are going to fight and argue with you or bring you down. So what eventually happened? Well, we know what happened. How did it how did it happen? What eventually happened? Um, well, uh, one of I was very specific. So, for example, I said I prefer rocky beaches to sandy ones. So if someone loved the Jersey Shore, they weren't my person. Mm -hmm. But I wanted them to know that up front. I said I was a widow up front. If they had a problem with the amount of baggage that I was bringing in. Get yeah. to stepping. Yep. Just say no, because let's not even start. Um so there was this day, July 1st, 2018, and I had gone through this whole process of releasing my husband's ashes, of scattering them literally all over the world, because I felt like I needed to do that to start dating, to open a door. And so I had these kind of rituals that I went through to move me along. M my rings, I took my rings off my neck when I started dating. Um, and I swiped on this guy and I said, you know, I'm going to go to one of these two movies and it's a hot day and let's meet someday. And he wrote back, his name's Wayne, and he wrote back and said, well, let's go to one of the two movies I suggested, Jurassic World, and let's have someday be today. And I thought, oh, Okay, we can do that. And then we just started dating and we had sort of the same notion about it that each date was an opportunity to learn more about each other. And so we alternated dates. You know, his first date was we did a picnic and we each alternated choosing foods. My first date was a graffiti mural crawl in Spanish Harlem and then blues, you know? And so we, we went back and forth with different things that we loved to get to know each other, but I still couldn't be touched for close to six months. If he tried to kiss me, I had a panic attack. No kidding. It was crazy. But if I was going to move from you know, kind of a, a close friendship into an actual intimate relationship, I had to somehow get past it. And so I, I couldn't trust my chemistry. You know, we go into relationships and we think, well, your chemistry will tell you if it's right. My chemistry, if I was in a, a moment where I had had a bad day or I was in the middle of grieving or something, he could touch me and I could say, get away from me, mm. literally. And so I had to get really, really clear if it was me, him or us. 
because until I had the answer to that question, I didn't know what to do next. Right. That was really useful. So let me ask where you are today. That relationship is still going well, I hope. Yeah. Um, now, are you still consulting as the bad widow? And is there a specific, is there a more specific niche now or, or is it more broad that you, you coach in different areas? Yeah. So I work with, with people after loss. So it has changed. It has changed. Yes, it has changed okay. somewhat. So it was much more specific to sort of widows and widowers. And what I've discovered is that the process of moving through loss is pretty much the same across the board. So my grounding is I know a lot about how to actually practically move through this and get through it whole um, and actually come back stronger. Because one of the things that happens is that after the loss, you're a different person with different priorities very often Yeah. because it makes you face what matters. Let, let me ask you, when we talk about loss, a lot of people feel that what has transpired with COVID for a lot of people has been a loss for them. You know, um, for, for me, the only thing is, I used to enjoy looking in pawn shops and, you know, used bookstores and uh, things like that. You know, maybe going to a few restaurants or whatever. I'm okay with not uh, doing those things for a while. In fact, I'm okay not doing it at all. Really, I don't really miss it. But a lot of people, it seems to have impacted them much more profoundly. How did it impact you? And what are your feelings about people coping with with what's going on? Uh, well, I'm in New York and March, April of 2020, we were the center of all of it. I mean, we had people dying in droves. And so around the rest of the country, there were people saying this is not real. And yeah, I live still are. Yeah. Yeah. And I live looking over the emergency parking, the parking lot of an ER. And we would see 25 ambulances at all times and hear sirens 24 seven. And the medical examiner is a block away. So we had refrigerator trucks practically on my street. And so for us, um, we, we really were told to, to stay inside and to mask up and do all of that. And our situation was so dire that really a lot of people complied because we could see what was happening. I mean, we had people dying all around. And so what happened was that when we, when we stopped going out and stopped doing things, my boyfriend and I loved to, to wander the city and we really didn't do that. So it was pretty normal for us to walk 10,000 steps every day of the weekend, completely normal. If we walked 500 steps, a thousand steps, that was a lot in the course of the pandemic. So there were things we loved that we stopped doing. And when we, we started, we realized at a certain point that we were so afraid that we had stopped seeing what was real. And so we started going out. We went and we got on this public ferry because we could get outside. And so it was safer. And then we tried buses. We started doing bus dates. And then we did subways. And so we started just pushing out on our own fears mm. to see what was real. Yeah. Doesn't happen by itself. My nephew chose his college online. Never got to go walk around with people, you know, spend a night in a dorm. I mean, it's fine. It'll be fine. But that's a loss. I don't know if you're familiar with um, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had a, a thing where she wrote about the five stages 
of grieving and I think it was denial and then eventually you come to terms with acceptance. What's, the with acceptance. What, now, without digressing too much, I thought it was really fascinating because I remember looking at it and I actually wrote a blog post and made an infographic showing her stages or five stages because I said, What's interesting, what was interesting to me was from a marketing standpoint, as a digital marketing guy, I found that almost all clients that I would talk to, almost all business owners would go through the same stages until they were finally ready to take things seriously. Do you think that those five stages were applicable for you? But then to flip it, do you think that those five stages are applicable to people, you know, who are coaches or starting their own businesses? I think that, um, I think that the five stages are true. I think that they're not as linear as they're portrayed. So it doesn't just march along. Uh, there right. were times when fear, grief, anger, and shame, they were all present. There were times when grief and joy rose at the same time. There were times when I was accepting in one area and not accepting in another area. So it's, it's more complicated than how it's portrayed. But I do think that it's important to have some, some way of measuring that you're moving. You know, because time during the pandemic was so slippery. Time after my husband and I were so slippery because you don't have the appointments or I'm going out to meet friends or I'm was weird, right? Yeah, because from from your perspective, you're still relatively in a new uh, relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you have this big mountain fall on you. So it's like, well, wait a minute, the things that we were doing before to court one another and get used to one another, well, we really can't do those. Um, so how did you switch gears? Well, you, 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 you said that you gradually expanded into going outdoors and getting on, on buses and things of this nature and a ferry and everything. So how can, what do you think people watching or listening can kind of take away from that? Well, I think that that what people need to realize is that that stretching out again after something like a pandemic, it's not going to happen automatically. It really is a choice. And so that kind of takes back some of the power, honestly. So if you know that you can actually do something about the fear by stepping out a little bit and seeing what what's real, mm. what's not real. Yeah, without getting it and ending up in a hospital, too, I think. But, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, honestly, I mean, when when it first started, I, you know, I, I, I didn't really know what to think. And I mean, even mm -hmm. now, for me, it, yeah, it took a while to have the comfort level to really say, OK, I'm ready to go and go to a nearby forest. Yep. Or even go to a beach because inevitably you're going to see somebody there. And in Florida, most people will not wear masks. Uh, the vaccination rate is very low. So for me, it took a while to just say, okay, I'm going to go for a walk in the forest. Mm -hmm. And if I feel uncomfortable, I'll just put on a mask. And if I see somebody coming, I'll just go disappear into the woods or something. Um, usually when people see you with a machete on your hip, they know to give you some space. Uh, but at a beach, you, yeah, if they have any sense. Now, at a beach, you really can't do that. And um, I'm still, you know, not that comfortable around crowded beaches because people will come up to you, uh, especially these people walking their dogs. They'll come right up to you, no respect for your physical space or anything, and just start, you know, talking or whatever. So, yeah, you really have to kind of weigh that and give yourself some room. How is learning to make distinctions important to reinventing yourself after a loss like the one that you went through? 
to kind of yeah. switch gears. Yeah, totally. So, so making distinctions is really important because if you can figure out exactly what you like, what you need, what you want, what kind of support you want, for example, hmm. then you can ask specifically enough for people to deliver it. But if you don't know what you want or what you need more specifically, then you're not going to know to ask people for it. You're not going to, to ask for it. And yes. And people will give you their best guess and it's usually wrong. Yeah. Cause they're trying to get inside your head or understand what they think you need or want, but from their perspective. Right. And, and how can they know? I mean, it's, it's unrealistic. It is as realistic as going on a first date with someone and expecting them to know what kind of food you like, what kind of restaurant you're going to go to, what kind of decor you want, what kind of all of that without telling them. Mm. So it's crazy. So what's <laughs> so, okay. So to get these outcomes that you want, yep. is it, asking the right people for what you what you think you want what you think you need as specifically as you can on the basis of what you said before is that is that right well the first thing is to figure out who you are after the loss so if you're a different yeah. person they may be trying to deliver to the person they knew you as before Okay, so they're going to get it wrong because they're not talking to the same person, but they, you look the same. And there's no reason they should know that you're actually not the same anymore. So the first thing to do is to figure out who you are and what you want. You know, are you going to want to be going out more with friends? Are you going to want to do quieter things? Are you going to want to do? And so then who do you have in your network? So this is the rebuild your networks. What holes have been left by the loss? And who do you need to fill those holes? And what kind of a person? What kind of a person? So is it someone to take the kids so you can take a shower? Is it someone to go out with and just have a normal evening out? Is it someone to brainstorm business with? It's mm. all different, but until you figure out what you need, what you want, you can't figure out what person will deliver that. Right. How did you manage to rebuild your personal and professional networks so that they would deliver what you needed more um, efficiently or more easily? The first thing I did was I looked at what my husband provided because in all those places I had holes. And I looked at my existing network to see where I had what I needed and where I was missing what I needed. I looked at if there were people who could step up into those places, because networks are not designed to fill in after someone loses a spouse. They're just not built that way. You know, and there's no reason they should be, but it leaves a lot of holes, a lot of holes. And so the first thing was to assess my existing network and to figure out what I wanted and needed. And then to start matching my network with my needs. Like, could they provide the resources mm -hmm. that I needed? I think that's pretty deep, actually, because it's something that very, very few people really do. And when you look at the definition of um, mm -hmm. the mastermind group, that is a term that is much maligned and, and, and much uh, misunderstood. That's actually, I think it was Edison who started that whole concept, who yeah. was a, really a master of marketing himself. But that was his whole concept was to find people who filled in deficits but also their personalities could collaborate with yours and then say, okay, well, what, what do I have that they can uh, benefit from so we can have a mutual relationship here and start bringing these people together in, a, in the same room. Now, of course, you could do it uh, virtually. So how did that work out for you? 
How did that play out? It worked out brilliantly. I mean, I actually have networks at this point who, which can deliver what I need, but that only happened once I figured out what I needed and started matching them up. Now, how much of that was self-care? How much of that was other things? So self-care, I use, I use self-care. Getting present was the only way to escape the pain for a lot of this process. Now, when you say present, mm -hmm. define what you mean. Is that what, 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 when most people say mindful, it's like, well, what do you mean by that? Does that mean not thinking about the past? and not worrying about the future, but just saying, here I am right now working on this or wanting to do this? Well, I mean, there's not a lot of doing to being present. Like when I sing and my singing is just about communicating the song, I'm not doing anything but singing the song. Uh, when, you, when you do breathing practices, you're not doing anything but breathing. Yeah, And then there are self cares that are like affirmations and things like that. But those are more head things. For me, one of the most powerful things to do was to get present in my body. So breath work, movement, singing, drumming, that kind of thing was really good for me. Um, being out in nature. But anytime you're using your five senses to really focus not on the past or the future, but in right now, you can center and ground from anywhere. It gives more richness to the present moment. So a week from now, you're going to have new memories that are very detailed, uh, very specific that you can refer back to. Would you agree? Absolutely. And from there, you can access joy. And after loss, joy is really hard to come by. But from being present, you can access joy. Uh, that makes pretty good sense. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. For people uh, out there who want to uh, engage your services as a coach or maybe read your book, could you go into more detail about how they can learn more about you, work with you, and find your book? Absolutely. So my website is badwidow.com and my book is on Amazon. The paperback is on Amazon now. It's called The Bad Widow Guide to Life After Loss, Moving Through Grief to Live and Love Again. And so the paperback is available now. The ebook will be available September 20th. Um, and other than that, badwidow.com finds me for okay. everything. Well, I really appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you so much, David. Okay. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.